Good afternoon. At the Cato Institute, we like to say that freedom plays a central role in human progress. And as we've heard from Johann Norberg and others uh, yesterday, the past few decades of globalization have seen unprecedented improvements in human well-being, especially in developing countries. Human progress and the spread of dignity is the triumph and the grand narrative of classical liberalism. And yet, we are told, free markets and overconsumption are destroying the planet. This panel is about how it is not the end of the world. We are not running out of resources, and there are rational ways to deal with challenges such as climate change that don't include undermining the policies and institutions that support progress. At the Cato Institute, we publish uh, what we call the Human Freedom Index with our friends at the Fraser Institute. It is a broad measure of economic, personal, and civil uh, freedoms. I mention this because uh, there's a strong connection between freedom and prosperity that is important to keep in mind as we talk on this panel about uh, human well-being and ways to maintain progress. More human freedom is not only related to greater wealth, but also to the whole range of human well-being indicators, such as uh, life expectancy, access to safe drinking water, lower infant mortality rates, and on and on and on. But we are here in Argentina, so I'll just show you a couple of slides uh, about Argentina. And as you can see, in the past 20 years of mostly Peronist rule uh, in Argentina, the fall in freedom here has been notable. Argentina now uh, ranks 77 out of 165 countries. It was at 41 and it fell. But it is in terms of economic freedom where Argentina has a dismal record. It now ranks 158 out of 165 countries in terms of economic freedom. And if you break that down to different categories, like uh, regulation, you can see how there's been a fall there too. Argentina ranks 143 out of 165 countries. It literally is one of the most regulated countries in the world. It is also one of the most closed economies and has among the worst monetary policies in the world, ranking 163 and 161 uh, respectively in those areas. It really has a dismal record in economic freedom. Well, you get the picture. Uh, it's important to safeguard freedom if we want to continue to enjoy progress, and that's the message of the Human Freedom Index and m much of the, the work that, in, that uh, we do at the Cato Institute. I want to invite uh, both of the speakers, Marion Tupi and Bjorn Lomborg, to join me on stage, and I'll begin by introducing... I'll begin by introducing Marion Tupi. Marion Tupi is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He heads up our Human Progress Project. He is the author of the book, Superabundance. Let's give him a well welcome. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Ian, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, we have gathered here uh, in order to talk about the rebirth of uh, liberalism in Argentina and beyond. Um, and of course, if I could see my notes, that would be great. And of course, the reason why we are talking about um, a rebirth of liberalism in Argentina and beyond is because um, uh, liberalism has uh, never uh, been universally accepted and it has always been challenged. In other words, since its birth in the 18th century, liberalism has always faced a lot of opposition. Now, some of the traditional uh, opposition was the traditional and reactionary conservatism, uh, romanticism, militaristic nationalism, fascism and national socialism, and socialism and communism. Over time, most of these fell away, but uh, new challenges to liberalism have emerged. 
These include populism, postmodernism, religious fundamentalism, and uh, one that this panel will be devoted to, which is extreme environmentalism. Caring about the environment is laudable, but extreme environmentalism is a threat to liberalism because of some of its defining features. Among them are techno-optimism, which sees new technology as a threat rather than as a potential help with problems that humanity faces, such as climate change. Hence, the opposition of the extreme environmentalists to nuclear power, even though nuclear energy produces no CO2 in the atmosphere. Extreme environmentalists also tend to be anti-agentic. They deny individual autonomy and therefore our capacity to change our behavior, such as polluting the environment. That can lead to fatalism and apocalyptic thinking. But it can also lead to calls for centralization of control and collectivism, both of which aim to restrict individual choices and actions. By that logic, free enterprise, and the high living standards which capitalism creates must be abolished. Finally, extreme environmentalists evaluate human life solely in terms of its effect on the environment. A child, therefore, is not a source of happiness and potential, but a carbon footprint which needs to be minimized. Now, as far as I can tell, extreme environmentalists are concerned about main two issues. One is climate change, that Bjorn will be talking about, and the second is resource scarcity, which I propose to talk about. In theory, resources are finite. Population growth increases the use of resources. As a result, the price of resources goes up, resources become scarcer, and when resources become scarcer, standards of living must drop and famine must ensue. Now, this theory, it is claimed, works in two ways. First of all, it should work when population increases. When population increases, such as, for example, between 1800 and 2024, population of the world rose from 1 billion people to 8 billion people, so we should see greater scarcity. But the claim also works if the population flatlines or if the population starts to fall. Why? Because as people grow richer, they use more resources. So it doesn't matter whether the population goes up, whether it flatlines or whether it decreases, we should continue to use more resources in the future. Question is, is the theory true? So, in our book, we measure abundance with time prices. A time price basically asks you how long you have to work in order to earn enough money to buy something. If today you have to work an hour in order to buy a pound of butter, but in five years' time you have to work only 30 minutes to buy a pound of butter, that means you are twice as well off. Time prices unlike, uh, are not measured in dollars and cents, they are measured in minutes and hours of work. In our book, we looked at 50 basic commodities, the most important and the most widely traded commodities between 1980 and 2018. What we found is that on average, the time price of these commodities fell by 72%. This is from a perspective of a, an average global worker, which means that the abundance of resources relative to the wages of average global worker rose by about 250%. A different way to put it is, for example, pork. In terms of time prices, it fell by 85%, which means that, that our notional average global worker was 550% better off in 2018 than in 1980. We can look at the same data from a country perspective. Your typical Chinese worker saw time prices of the 50 basic commodities fall by 97.5%, which means that his or her abundance of commodities has risen by close to 4,000%. We have seen similar things happen around the world, though not as extensive. Chile, for obvious reasons, was the best performer 
over that time period uh, in, in Latin America between 1980 and 2015. Uh, there, uh, the, the time price fell by almost 70%, which is that a typical Chilean would be 20, 228% better off. Even Argentina saw close to 200% increase in abundance. However, in preparation for this conference, we have updated this data to 2023. Over the last five years since, the, since, since we had the last data, oh, what has happened in the world? We had the COVID pandemic, we had the rise in protectionism, we had inflation and we had growing instability. Therefore, abundance of resources has fallen globally, but nowhere as much as in Argentina. According to our updated data, a typical Argentine at the end of 2023 was 13% poorer in terms of his access to resources than he or she was in 1980. We have not seen negative uh, abundance rates in any of our previous research. This is the first time that we have encountered one, and perhaps that is the reason why President Millet was elected at the end of 2023. Nonetheless, in spite of the last four years not being very good in terms of increasing abundance, the overall trend is toward increasing abundance. And it is therefore, I think, appropriate to look at some of the ways in which human beings can increase their resource base. Well, the most obvious one is increased supply. When a commodity goes up in price, that gives us a signal that we should be looking for new um, uh, reserves of, um, of commodities because that will produce profit, right? So people have a profit motive to go and search for new deposits. And that is why today we have more known reserves of oil than we did 100 years ago in spite of using oil for the last 100 years. The other way in which you can increase supply is through technological breakthroughs. The usual methods of drilling for oil, for example, reached their limit. At some point, drilling for more oil become, became uneconomical. But then humans came along and, and figured out fracking. And fracking now allows us to get at oil and gas, which we previously couldn't get access to. Another way to increase our resource base is through increased efficiency. This can be done absolutely as well as relatively. Relatively, we are becoming more efficient per unit of output. A can of Coke used to weigh three ounces of aluminum. Today, it weighs only half an ounce of aluminum. But when an economy becomes super efficient, like, for example, the United States, we can decouple economic growth from resources absolutely. So for the longest time, what we saw was resources and, and economic growth grow in parallel. But then Andrew McAfee from MIT noticed that about 15 years ago, there was a decoupling. The American economy continues to increase, continues to grow, but the absolute amount of stuff, the tonnage of zinc and copper and what have you, is actually decreasing. In fact, McAfee found that out of 72 commodities tracked by the United States Geological Survey, 66 were post-peak in the United States. We can also increase value from a resource. When we first started melting sand in order to create glass, we used glass for beads to look prettier. Then we realized that we could use glass in order to create glasses like this. Sometime later, we figured out that glass could be used for windows. And today, we melt sand to create glass that goes into fiber optic cables and microchips. So you can see that with every step of the way, the value from a grain of sand has increased. We can turn something that was useless into something that is useful. When we start, first started drilling for oil, we encountered a lot of natural gas. But we didn't know what to do with it, so we burned it. We flared it. Now we can capture all that gas, we can sell it, and we use gas for heating of our homes or producing electricity, which then lights our homes. Substitution. We used to kill whales in order to get their oil with which to make light so that we can read. But today we use electricity produced by natural gas or maybe nuclear power. We don't actually care as a species how we get our light to read. 
what we do care about is that we do get the light to read. And so it happens that due to fossil fuels, we no longer have to kill those majestic whales. Dematerialization. 15 years ago, in every nice hotel around the world, you had a thick copper cable running out of the wall that you, need to plug into, that you needed to plug into your computer in order to get Wi-Fi. All, that, all those cables are gone. All that copper is being used somewhere else because Wi-Fi has been dematerialized. It's in the air. You can think of an iPhone. It's not just a phone. It's also an alarm clock. It's a notepad. It's a calculator. It's a TV. It's a radio. So you can see how humans can stretch their resource base by dematerialization. Recycling and reuse. In spite of using a lot of resources over the last 200 years since the start of the Industrial Revolution and thousands of years since the birth of civilization, all those resources are still on the planet. Yes, there is some iron and some aluminum which is trapped in a car or a bus downstairs, but all of that material can be reused in order to do something else. During the Second World War, for example, the American government gave the Manhattan Project 14,000 tons of silver in order to create electromagnets which were needed for the production of the nuclear weapon. But when people realized that other materials could be used for electromagnets, all that silver was returned back to the government, supposedly to prop up the value of the American dollar. But you know what I mean. Transmutation. Transmutation has been a stuff of legend and myth for millennia. But transmutation actually happens all the time. The Big Bang only created hydrogen. And that hydrogen, which was subjected to tremendous pressures and tremendous temperatures within stars, was turned into different metals. When those stars exploded, they seeded the universe with all the elements which we have on Earth. So we can trans transmute one element into another because we already have here on the planet everything we need. What is a star? Star is a fusion reactor. And we know how to do fusion. It's currently uneconomical, but it may become economical in time. And of course, hydrogen is very plentiful in our oceans. But by the time that we need fusion reactors and hydrogen in order to create elements which may become scarce, we'll be a sp space mining civilization. We'll be sending humanoid robots, maybe the ones that Elon Musk makes, and we'll load them with AI and we'll send them to mine the asteroid belt for all the metals and water and bring it back to Earth. All we need is more knowledge. All we need is more ideas. That's where people come in. More ideas, more people means more ideas. More ideas lead to more innovations. More innovations lead to higher productivity and higher productivity then translates into higher standards of living. We are not like other animals. Other animals, when they run out of stuff, if they eat all the grass or all the leaves on the trees, they die. We don't, because we innovate. We innovate our way out of scarcity by producing new knowledge. And knowledge has a peculiar quality. The more knowledge you consume, the more knowledge you have. If you can grasp that, then you can understand how we can use ever more resources in our industrial era and yet end up with more resources that are getting cheaper. Our analysis goes back to 1850, and it shows that resources are increasing at a faster pace than population grows. And that means that on average, every additional human being creates more than they consume, creates more than they destroy. And when abundance of resources grows at a faster pace than population, we call that relationship superabundance. So Julian Simon, who was a senior fellow at the Cato Institute before unfortunately dying far too young, was absolutely right. Children who are born into this world don't come simply with an empty stomach, but also with a brain capable of creating new knowledge. It is people who are the ultimate resource. But of course, people are not enough. 
if population size was all you needed, China would have been the richest country for the last two and a half thousand years, because it's also been the most populous country for the last two and a half thousand years. But China, as well as India, were very poor until they embarked on their respective reforms in 1978 and in 1991. So to innovate, people must be free to think, speak, publish, associate, save, invest, trade, and profit. And the market, the market must be free because market needs to sort out bad ideas from good ideas. Yes, people have a lot of ideas, but most of them are very bad. And that is why you need the free market to tell you what will work and what will not work. You also need a free market to choose between more and less valuable innovations. That's how iPhone overtook BlackBerry. So superabundance equals population times freedom. Freedom is a very important component of superabundance. So in conclusion, the theory of overpopulation and overconsumption is incorrect. The world's population keeps expanding, but the prices of resources keep on falling relative to wages. Resources are growing more abundant, not despite of population growth, but because of population growth, or to be more precise, because of the new knowledge which this growing population can produce. And finally, knowledge creation works best when people and the markets are free. Muchas gracias. Viva la libertad, carajo! Thank you, Marion. It's now uh, my pleasure to introduce Bjorn Lomborg. He is the head of the Copenhagen Consensus, and I think that he's doing some of the most important work in economic development and uh, environmental policy. He specializes in debunking uh, environmental and development fads, uh, many of which are not uh, based in rational analysis, and in proposing uh, policies that are based in uh, rational analysis and that would produce superior uh, results. So please help me welcome uh, Bjorn. Thank you, Ian. Okay, really. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here, and thank you very much for all the organizers to make this happen. Uh, so what I really want to talk about is the other big thing that we all worry about. Um, would love to, oh, I have my slides. I just don't have them here, which would be nice too. Um, which is climate change. If you have kids, it's very likely that they're very worried about climate change. Uh, we now know from uh, surveys uh, across the OECD, so most of the rich world, about 60% of all people, not just kids, but certainly also kids, worry so much about climate change that they believe that unmitigated global warming will likely, or very likely, lead to the end of mankind. I spoke a little bit with, uh, with Alex yesterday because he told us, and I think very rightly so, we need to have a positive vision. We need to have a utopia to, you know, basically to give away to everyone else to understand all the good things that we're actually arguing for. But here is one way and here's one place where I think we actually need to be able to say, here are the facts that contradict your worry. Because this is not about a utopia, this is about a dystopia. This is about believing that the end of the world is nigh. So Marion was just telling us about how we think, oh my God, we're going to run out of all resources, we have to do something, we have to change our course. But the reality, of course, is that if you think the world is going to end because of global warming, nothing else matters. If global warming is the end of the world, that's all we should be concerned about. And that is why this is really a big issue to confront. Because if arguments are going to be made to say, well, you have to spend 5, 10, 20 percent of your GDP on solutions for climate change, because otherwise the world is going to end, you will never have enough resources, you'll never have enough opportunity to actually do all the things that will make the world better. So what I'm going to spend 
uh, a little less than 20 minutes I'm talking on, is why are there some of these great arguments? And this is really where we can use the arguments. We can use the data. We can show people that actually the story is very different from what you hear. Uh, on 20 minutes, I can't go through all of it. I'm sure we'll have a lot of exciting questions afterwards. But I just want to show you a few of those statistics, which I think are the way that we can get people to realize, yes, climate change is a problem, but it's not the end of the world. And that means we should stop wasting trillions as we are right now, and we should certainly make sure that Argentina doesn't jump on that wagon as well. Instead, we should spend billions of dollars, yes, but smartly and effectively, and fix this problem while recognizing that there are many other things we need to fix as well. So please join me in this conversation. First of all, global warming, it's real, it's man-made, it is a problem. I think it's absolutely ridiculous to make the argument, oh, there's no such thing, it's all natural. No, there is a problem, and that's what the science is telling us. But it's often exaggerated, and that's what I'm talking about, that's what our kids are worried about. That is what really makes this world much, much worse, because everybody's worried, and we're spending way too much money on a problem that is manageable, but it is a problem, but not the end of the world. Let me just show you one. There's a lot of different st statistics I could share with you, but let me just share with you this one on wildfire. Everybody tells you that because of global warming, the world is now a light. It's burning up. Uh, New York Times had as a website uh, uh, postcards from a world on fire. That was literally what it was called. And when you clicked in there, the first thing you see is a totally dark face. And then you see the world spinning around. It's really well done. They have a lot of money. Uh, spinning around totally on fire. Is that true? No, it's not. And we actually have good data for how much the world burns. If you look at how much the world burned from 1900, well, we have good reconstructions from 1900 to about 2000 because this is needed to do climate models. So this is very well accepted. And what we've seen is that no, the global historical rec reconstruction shows that we have less fire in the world today. So it used to be about 4.2% of the world burnt. And about now, it's much lower and this particular uh, thing, it's almost down to 3%. But since 1997, we have satellites from NASA circling the world 24-7, measuring pretty much all, or at least all, big fires. And if you look at that, it's actually declined even more. In 2022, which is the latest year that we have good data for, I've indicated where 2023 probably ends up, in 2022, it was the lowest burn ever. Did you hear that? No, you didn't, because it doesn't fit the story. But again, this is where we can tell people a very different story. You hear a lot about fires, but that's because the camera crews only go to where the fire is. You know, there's no camera crew going, I'm here out reporting, and there's no fire here. <laughs> you know, that, that just doesn't work, really work, right? but it doesn't inform you. And that's, of course, why we need to tell people we have good data for this. Why has this happened? It has very little to do with climate. It has everything to do with humans. As Marion also pointed out, most humans don't want fire, and so we actively make our environment such that there's less fire. This is mostly human-made, and this has very little to do with climate, but it is important to recognize that with humans, we don't have more fire, we have, in general, less fire. What about the future? Well, if you look out into the future, and if we do nothing about climate change, this is what one study indicates we'll see. We'll see even less fire into the future. If we do climate policy, we will see even less fire. But this is a very different conversation. It's not the world is on fire, and if we don't do something, we're all going to burn up. It is a there is a problem, because if we do climate policy, we can probably have even less fire. That might be good, but it's not to avoid Armageddon. It's to make sure that we make the world even better. And then, of course, we can start talking about how much is that going to cost and how much good is that going to do? I think, fundamentally, we get it wrong on global warming 
because we always miss adaptation. We forget that most people actually adapt. That's what we see with fire. Uh, I think this is the single strongest uh, graph that I'm going to show you, namely the fact that if you look at how many people die from climate-related disasters, so that's floods, droughts, storms, and wildfires, well, we have pretty good data over the last 100 years. It fluctuates a lot, so I'm going to show you decadal averages. And what has happened in the 1920s, on average, nearly half a million people died each and every year from climate-related disasters. That's terrible. Popular opinion would make you believe that this number has gone up. You can kind of see, I, I don't have space to go up, so you know where I'm going to show this. But fundamentally, no, it's not. These are the official numbers that we know from the International Disaster Database. It has gone from about half a million people dying each year to about 15,000 people dying each year, or about a 97% reduction. Remember, at the same time, the world population has quadrupled, so what we've actually seen in individual risk is more than a 99% reduction. Again, this has nothing to do with climate, but everything to do with the fact that when we lift people out of poverty, when we become smarter, more technologically advanced, we know more, we get better prediction models, we are better able to handle whatever nature throws at us. This is an indication of how we as a species have dramatically succeeded in an uncertain world. It is likely that climate change will add some damage to the world. That's why it's a problem. But it's very likely that we can take away much more of that damage because we're smart people. This is what you show your kids when they're really worried. The world is not on fire. The world is not ending. The world is getting better and better because of human ingenuity, because we are resilient. We need to recognize that. That's the only way we're going to have this conversation smartly. We need to understand that climate change is not the end of the world. It's a problem. And that also means recognizing that really what this means is things get better and better, as Marion also showed us. And as we've talked about, in a lot of ways, we live longer, we're richer, we're better educated, our kids die less, all these great things. What climate change means is not the end of the world. It means that the world gets better and better, but slightly slower. Let me show you an example. When we look at hunger deaths in the world, it's actually a dramatic thing. About seven million kids used to die each and every year from hunger in, the, uh, in 1990. And since then, it's dramatically dropped, mostly because we got richer, because food prices are going down, because we are more resilient, because we know how to deal with many of these problems. This is a fantastic outcome. What you see from 2020, so remember, we still see about more than two million kids die each and every year from malnutrition. We should certainly do something about that. What we're expecting, because we'll get richer, because we'll get high-yielding varieties, because we'll be producing more food, we keep estimating that this will go down. This is an estimate from the World Health Organization. They tried to say, what would happen if there was no global warming, which, of course, is impossible to do, but you can do it in a model. This is what you see. It'll keep going down and down and down. But then what they said, what happens if we do nothing about climate? It will get better, but slightly slower. You may have a hard time seeing it, but if you see there, yes, it will be a little worse, which means it will get much better, but slightly slower. That's what climate change is. Climate change slows down the amazing progress in the world. That's a problem. That's why we should be thinking about fixing it. But it's not the end of the world. This, I think, is one of the amazing things that we can help uh, get everybody on board with, all of the people who are so worried about that this is going to be the civilizational challenge that we need to address. No, it's not. And actually, we need to know much, much better this is not the end of the world, it's a problem, and that will help us make much better decisions. This matters because the current way that we're trying to deal with climate are just simply unrealistic, and hence they're also unsustainable. They are probably way too expensive that even you can imagine Germany and other countries to pay for them, let alone the rest of the world. Take a look at how much of the world gets its energy from renewables. If you look from 1800, we forget 
that we used to be an almost entirely renewably organized uh, uh, economy. In 1800, we estimate 84% of all energy in the world came from renewables. It was really only uh, Great Britain who was starting to use coal. That was it. We got all of our power from ourselves, from our draft animals, from wind turbines, a little bit of sails. That was pretty much it. Since then, it has gone down and down and down. We spent the last 200 years getting rid of renewables. It's only in the 2010s when we've started to massively invest money in green energy that we've seen a slight uptick. Notice we've gone from about 13%, 13, 14% for half a century here. This was almost entirely poor people cooking and uh, keeping warm with dung, wood, cardboard, that kind of thing. This is all that we have gotten from the amazing transition that we've been talking about for the last 20 years. We've gone from, say, 13, 14%, maybe up to about 16%. This is the International Energy Agency uh, latest data for 2023. People will tell you, politicians will tell you, without blushing at all, that we're going to go to net zero, that we're going to have 100% renewables by 2050, or even that we're going to get there by 2030, which, of course, is just silly. No, it's not. If you look at the International Energy Agency, which has gone very gung-ho on green, uh, they believe that we'll probably end up around 34% by mid-century of renewable energy. If you look at Biden's Energy Information Administration, it's a much less uh, uh, optimistic scenario that we'll probably get to, say, 26%. But that doesn't mean that we're going to get there anytime soon. If you just take this as a linear equation, it looks like the IEA will get us to 100% in 2153, and IEA, so uh, EIA, sorry, the Biden administration, in 2253. We are 150 to 250 years away on current trends. We're not, as most people would like to make you believe, on a fast track to a transition in the world. We're on a slow train, and a very costly slow train, to almost nowhere. And so what we need to recognize is that when we think about how do we do cl smart climate policy, we need to recognize that climate has real cost. Climate is a problem. It has real cost. We should recognize that. But what we need to get everybody else to recognize is climate policy also has real costs. Given that we're the only ones to pay those prices, we actually have to make a decision on how much are we willing to spend on both of these places. This is what uh, William Nordhaus, the only climate economist to ever win the Nobel Prize, that was his basic point. That's what he won the Nobel Prize for. And that's where he shows that we should not be doing anywhere near what we're proposing. Just to show you, we've actually never... So almost all politicians in the world suggest that we should go net zero by 2050. Surprisingly, there's never been an estimate of how much will that cost and how much good will it do. Uh, the McKinsey Institute tried to make an estimate in 2021. There was not a government-funded thing. And then in 2023, uh, the climate change economics actually asked a lot of economists to come up, and this is the average of all their models, what it showed. What they found was there are real benefits to go net zero, which is why you know, climate change is a problem. What they found was the net benefit would actually result in, well, you almost can't see it, $4.5 trillion. That's a lot of money each and every year, so that's a real thing. But what they also showed us was that the cost would be almost $27 trillion each and every year. That means every dollar spent will avoid uh, 17 cents of climate damage. That's a really, really bad deal. We need to tell people this. We need to inform people. And of course, this is part of the conversation that also needs to be here in Argentina, saying, yes, there is a problem. No, it's not a smart way to spend all your money here. And so the reality is, what should we do? Well, we know a lot of things don't work. I'm just simply going to show you a very short outcome of what we have found working with more than 50 of the world's top climate economists and three Nobel laureates in finding out what really works and what doesn't. Well, we do know, for instance, the EU climate policies, the so-called 2020 policy, doesn't work. If you spend a dollar on these climate policies, you will avoid about three cents 
of climate damage. That's a bad deal. If you look at the net zero, as I just showed you, for every dollar spent, you will avoid 17 cents of climate damage. Again, a pretty darn bad outcome. There is a way, and every economist would tell you, if you do a smart global carbon tax, it will cost a lot of money, it will cost hundreds of trillions of dollars, but it will actually deliver more benefits back to humanity. Now, this is going to be phenomenally hard. It's very hard to imagine that we're going to get Russia on board. It's very hard to imagine that we're going to get a coordinated global effort for both the US and China and Argentina and everybody else. But this is something that we should at least consider. But there is a much, much better policy. And that's what we worked on, which we're very happy to show that this actually could really make a huge difference. We found that innovating green energy is really the big solution. It's no big rocket science, right? If you think about it, as long as we're imagining that we're going to fix climate change by telling everyone to be like Germany, we're in big trouble because nobody wants to be like Germany. Well, I mean, they're nice in some ways, but you certainly don't want to have their energy system. You don't want to have their incredibly high energy prices and pretty low reliability and pay half a trillion dollars for it. That's an unaffordable and unattractive proposition. But if we invest more money in making the next generation of green energy, and that could be, as Marion talked about, nuclear power, it could even be fusion, although we'll see whether that ever happens. And there's lots of other opportunities. Of course, we should also be investing in solar and wind and batteries and everything else. But the point is, if we could come up with an innovation that would make green energy cheaper than fossil fuels, everyone would switch. We wouldn't have to convince China or India or Africa or anyone else to switch. They would simply do it because the market told them this is a better deal. So what we should be doing is mostly focusing on making sure that green innovation is boosted such that we eventually get a solution to climate change. Now, if you think this is the end of the world, this doesn't feel sufficiently good. You feel like we've got to do something right now. But if this is a problem we need to solve over this century, along with many other things, this turns out to be by far the best investment. It's much cheaper, and it has much greater potential to long-run cut carbon emissions. And oh, it also means we can afford to think about all the other problems that we need to fix. And this, of course, is the argument, especially for Argentina and for everyone else, most of the world, when you have lots of other issues you want to fix, don't get derailed by this one thing. Make sure your kids know this is not the end of the world, it's a problem. And then make sure that, to let them know or let everyone know we're going to fix it, but smartly. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Bjorn. We have time for some questions now. And uh, the first question from Luciano Fal Falcinelli, what do you think of the falling birth rate and the aging population, the so-called demographic transition that we are going through? And I suspect that part of the question is also, what would you think of uh, a decrease in population growth? I think this is a question for Marion. Yes, sir. Um, so, According to the best estimates, the world's population will peak at about 9.4 billion people in uh, roughly 2070 or so, and, and then it will start declining. And we have to be aware of the fact that um, um, in a world of declining population, we may also get fewer ideas, which will have a negative consequence for economic growth. Now, th th that, that is a purely uh, sort of economic way of thinking about it, but also having fewer people in the world will also uh, prevent um, a lot of people who are not born from having uh, wonderful lives, being able to fall in love, being able to travel, being able to experience this beautiful world that we have. Um, so so uh, we've, got a, we've got a problem here, uh, potentially, and one way to get around it is by having more people living in freedom. 
So as, you, as, I, as I showed you uh, with my slides, uh, superabundance equals people times freedom. Right now, there are only very few countries in the world which are, as we say, on the frontier of innovation. Countries which are actually creating the uh, innovations that the entire world benefits from. It's the United States, it's uh, Western Europe, it's South Korea, it's Japan, it's Israel. But if more countries can have freedom, if more countries can um, have property rights uh, and so forth, uh, then more people will be able to participate in global economy, produce more knowledge and therefore benefit all of us. If that doesn't work, because right now political freedom around the world is actually decreasing, then another way of tackling the issue is by allowing people from uh, unfree countries to migrate into free countries. After all, Steve Jobs' father was born in Syria. And it is only by the good fortune of the fact that Steve Jobs was born in the United States and was able to plug into the American uh, system of credit and property rights uh, and so forth that he was able to actually put his genius to work and uh, create the Apple company. Just very briefly, I, th I, th yep. I think... I think we have to recognize that this is just a universal uh, 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 impetus to at least not have as many kids as we used to have. Uh, in many ways, it's a great opportunity, especially for women around the world, uh, which often were just you know, sort of birthing machines before. Uh, and and you know, we should welcome this. Yes, it'll create some problems. Uh, it'll also create a lot of opportunities for countries as India and many others. Uh, as you have fewer kids, you actually, for a while, uh, have more opportunity to give each one of these kids uh, good education, put more effort into them, and that will give you what's n typically known as a demographic dividend that will actually see slightly higher growth. But it will create problems in, in the long run, but I'm not sure we can really find a way to simply so, uh, solve it. But I would also say this is a very, very sort of uh, luxury problem compared to most of the things that we worried about for the last 200 years. And nothing I said should be misconstrued as yeah. saying that we should be forcing people to have more children than they want to. Uh, there is one value that is more dear to my heart than even economic growth, and that's freedom. <laughs> Pablo, Pla, <clears throat> Pablo Pla writes, uh, Bill Gates, in a book dedicated to climate change, summarized the devastating effects of an upcoming two degrees increase in global warming. Do you think that green energy innovation can be ready in time and how? Yeah, so the, sh the short version is, uh, so Bill and I disagree on some of these things. Uh, uh, he, has, um, he has taken some of the very uh, extreme concerns of two degrees, uh, and I think fundamentally we're not going to, and I don't think anyone really believes that we're going to uh, limit this to two degrees. Again, what you also have to recognize is that almost all of the estimates of damage costs, so I would love to uh, uh, share that with you. It's another slide that I delete it in order to make this uh, just in ten, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, but if you look at the new study done by Richard Tull, one of the most cited uh, climate economists, to indicate that a two degree warming, warming will cost about, say, 2% of global GDP each and every year. Uh, so by the end of the century, that could mean that we will be 2% less well off than we otherwise would be. Uh, a three degree warming might uh, implicate, say, 4% of global GDP. That sounds like something, and it certainly is a, a substantial amount of resources, but just remember, uh, by the end of the century, the UN estimate the average person on the planet will be 450% as rich as he or she is today. So we're going to be much, much richer in a sort of standard assessment, and what that means is it's going to feel like because remember, a lot of these are not actually market impacts, but non-market impacts, so it's GDP equivalent. What it will feel like is instead of being 450% as rich, we will only be 434% as rich. <laughs> that's still a pretty darn out good outcome. But yes, it could have been better, and that's, of course, why we need to have this conversation. Green energy will not be ready for the two degree, but it's very unlikely that we're going to get much above three degrees, which is a problem but not by any means the end of the world. And again, what we have to be very careful about is if we actually try to get to the two degree target, we may end up suffering and, and sacrificing trillions of dollars and literally 
uh, in the order of five to eight hundred trillion dollars of welfare for the for the world in order to uh, water off a much lower impact, which is a really bad deal. Those are astounding numbers, and you also mentioned that th there's a question here related to this that the press misinforms or gives the wrong impression about uh, threats uh, of climate change. Uh, the question is, what accounts for that? Why are they telling this story when the facts are pointing in the other direction? So, news media works by telling you what just happened in the last 24 hours. It's a very skewed selection of the worst things that happened in the last 24 hours, right? Uh, and, and so very clearly their job is not, and I think that's, it's unreasonable to expect that the New York Times and many others would be wanting to tell you, yes, there was a hurricane, but actually overall in the last hurricane seasons, we've not seen as many hurricanes as we used to do. They probably should, but they don't. They just tell you, oh, my God, there was a hurricane. It's probably related to climate change. I think it's also part of the fact that this plays into the whole conversation on left and right competition where you're arguing for, well, we should have a lot more of all kinds of things, one of them being this green, wonderful new world, which actually is a pretty dismal world, which is going to be incredibly expensive. Uh, but I think fundamentally what we have to insist on saying is when you see news outlets telling you here's an extra fire, uh, do you guys remember the, fire, the big fires in Australia in 2019-20? Uh, uh, probably everyone saw them. Did you know that it was actually one of the lowest fire years in Australia? The reason why you saw all the fires is that, very unusually for Australia, all the fires were near Melbourne and Sydney, where all the TV crews live. So it was much easier to view them, but we actually have satellite data that shows that it was a very low year of fire in all of Australia, but you only see part of the story. We need to make sure that we tell our kids, yes, there's a problem. It's not this scary picture that you see. And we know this from a lot of other data. If you think about it in the US, uh, uh, over the last 30 years, crime, according to the, UN, uh, to, to the US FBI, crime has dropped. Uh, so violent crime and violent robberies have dropped by respectively two thirds and halved. So it's gone down dramatically. But at the same time, you've got Fox and CNN and everybody showing you violence 24-7, lots of, of robberies, lots of uh, crime. And so every year Gallup asks Americans, is there more crime this year than there used to be? And they all say, well, a lot of them say yes, a vast majority say yes. So you have the very same experience that you think crime is getting worse and worse, while the actual numbers tell you they're getting less and less. And there's a lot of people, you know, so a lot of politicians will tell you there's a lot of crime, vote for me. Uh, there's a lot of police officers who would like to have bigger budgets. There's a lot of uh, 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 prisons, because they're privately funded in the US, who'd like to get more business. We need to tell people the actual facts, but we also need to make them realize there's a reason why you hear this very skewed and one-sided argument. What is the breakdown in your view, uh, Bjorn, uh, when confronting climate change uh, between adaptation and mitigation? Yeah, so it used to be that you couldn't say the word adaptation because it somehow, and, and I get, look, I get it. If you're very involved in saying we need to cut carbon emissions, we need to get more solar panels on, on the rooftop, adaptation sort of undermines some of that argument. But surely your point is not that you actually want solar power. Surely the point is that you actually want humans and the world to be better off. Um, what we find is that most adaptation will actually happen very, very easily because it's a good idea to do. That's why you don't really need, mostly you don't need government activity to make this happen. You do in one instance. If you're looking at sea level rise, it's not a good idea for everyone to have their own dike. You actually want to have everyone to have one common dike, right? So you do need government intervention in, in that case. But we do that. We do that very smartly. Sometimes it takes some catastrophes. We saw that with Katrina in the US. If you look at Holland, which is one of the great examples of how you do ad adaptation, remember 40% of, uh, of Holland's surface is below sea level. Uh, if you fly into uh, Amsterdam's airport, Schiphol, uh, they're, they're very proud. They say on their website they're the only airport uh, in the world that used to be 
the site of a major naval battle. Uh, but you know, you fly in there, you don't think that you're four, four or five meters below sea level. It's just a very well-organized country, but they also needed a big catastrophe in, uh, in 1953 to sort of get going. So we probably need more attention to, uh, to adaptation, but most of this will happen automatically. But what we need to ask people again is, what is the point here? Are you just trying to win an intellectual argument or a political argument? Are you just trying to uh, be a shill for solar companies? Or are you actually trying to make sure that this is the, what works out best for people? We do need to fix climate change in the long run, but we also need to fix it in a way that we can both afford, that's sustainable, and that actually makes economic sense. I think we have time for one last question. Bjorn mentioned uh, nuclear energy, and I wonder, uh, Marion, what you thought about that option, and uh, Bjorn, if you wanted to say something more about that. Right. So at, at Cato, we produced a very important study showing that the best way to generate energy is actually through natural gas. Natural gas produces half as much CO2 in the atmosphere as, as burning of coal. Um, so natural gas should be the way to go forward. However, if I'm speaking to an, an and I'm sure that people here understand that. However, if I'm speaking to an audience, um, uh, that, that is sort of <laughs> very pro-environmental, pro, pro if you want, uh, very green. Uh, the point I make is that, um, uh, of course, nuclear uh, may be more expensive, and it is more expensive than natural gas, but nuclear doesn't emit any CO2 into the atmosphere. So if you are, if you are almost religiously opposed to any CO2 emissions, then nuclear energy is the way to go. Now. What, does, what role would the government play here? I would simply say that if, it's, if, if the alternative here is to spend $800 trillion to tackle climate change or commit tens of billions of dollars to pepper the world with fission reactors, then, then obviously the second is a more, uh, more, more wiser policy to go. I, just two very short points. Uh, the problem with nuclear is right now that it's very costly. Uh, that means when you've already built your nuclear reactor, you should, of course, keep using as long as you can. Mm -hmm. what, what they've been doing in the US and in Germany and many other places is just sheer stupidity. You've already bought the nuclear reactor. You've already committed to eventually decommissioning it. Right now, it provides CO2-free energy at nearly zero cost. You, you, you don't ever stop existing nuclear power plants. But there is a problem in building more of them because they are very costly, especially in rich countries, because we have a lot of regulation. You can argue whether all that regulation is necessary, but you're not going to win the argument of, oh, let's make nuclear power a little less safe. That's just not going to win. What we can do is fourth generation nuclear. There's a lot of arguments that this modular small things, nuclear power could be very cheap and incredibly effective and much safer. That'd be a wonderful world. So I'm all for let's invest in that. Of course, we should remember the last three generations, they also told it was going to be incredibly cheap and it didn't turn out that way. So let's see. The second bit is to remember electricity in the world, and that's all that nuclear power does, is only about 20% of all energy use. Most energy use is in industry, heating, and agriculture, and these incredibly hard to replace things like steel, cement, fertilizer, those kinds of things that we just don't know how to fix without fossil fuels. So it's going to solve part of the problem, but it's not a, sol a solution for all of the problem. I would simply add that the reason why nuclear power is so expensive is because we stopped innovating, we stopped learning. The, the learning curve um, has been prevented from emerging in the 1970s. So if you want to know who is really responsible for climate change, who is really responsible for so much CO2 into the atmosphere, look at the people who prevented nuclear power from growing in the 1970s. It is the environmentalists who are responsible for climate change and for global warming. Thank you. And <laughs> Stephen, Stephen Pinker also makes the point that it's it's an extremely safe uh, uh, energy source, yes. safer than every other option. 
uh, and he, I think he makes a very convincing argument uh, using the data. Well, I'm afraid that we've run out of time, but I really do want to thank Marion and Bjorn for a great discussion today. Please read their work. It's extremely important. And thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>